Welcome to TYT Interviews. I'm Anna Kasparian, and I am beyond excited for the interview that I'm about to do right now. Uh, we are interviewing Chris Ryan, who is, along with his wife, the bestseller uh, author of Sex at Dawn, How We Mate, Why We Stray, and What It Means for Modern Relationships. Now, this is a very popular book that's been promoted quite a bit by Dan Savage, and it's controversial in nature because it kind of goes against what we've been conditioned to believe about modern relationships in society today. And part of the reason why I'm bringing you back on TYT interviews, you have been interviewed by Jenk before, is because this is more a self-indulgent conversation. And, oh, I, good. and hopefully it helps other people who are in relationships, who question monogamy, and who want to learn more about you know, what the reality is of relationships and what we're built for, what mm -hmm. our biology is. So um, before we get into specifics, uh, I want you to give the audience just a, a, a synopsis, a, a general summary of what your book is about. Okay, it, it's essentially arguing that human beings are um, evolved to be extremely sexual animals. We're probably the most sexual mammal alive. If you just look at how many sex acts we have per birth. Mm -hmm. Gorillas, for example, have 12 sex acts per birth on average. Uh, humans are close to 1,000. Right. So it's clear just, I mean, there are many other arguments in the book, but that sort of crystallizes uh, one of the main points, which is that sexual interaction for human beings isn't primarily about reproduction. It's taken on other roles over the millions of years of our evolution, as it has for some other animals specifically bonobos and chimpanzees, who are our two closest primate relatives by far, and dolphins. Mm -hmm. And if you look, what do those four species have in common? Chimps, bonobos, uh, dolphins, and humans, they're all highly social, highly intelligent animals. Mm -hmm. And so sexuality in each of those cases has taken on a social role. It enables us to form these um, networks of trust and intimacy and cooperation that end up working out better for everyone. Right. So that's that's the argument. Now, it doesn't go, I, I see where you're gonna try to take mm -hmm. this conversation. It doesn't really uh, go into giving advice. It's not about it's how not to about deal advice. with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. I'm happy to talk about that right. with you. But the book is just, this is what our species is. And not what you should do about that other than accept that that's what our species is. It doesn't mean right. you can't choose to be monogamous, for example, right? So uh, just to be clear, I don't yeah. want this to be advi about advice. I want it to be about evidence that talks about our human nature, what we're generally built for, and you know what, you know what how society plays a role in the way we act and right. why we choose to be monogamous. So uh, the part that I always really found fascinating about your argument is uh, you know, when you make the very clear statement that's obviously true regarding human sexuality and how we have sex purely for pleasure. It's not about procreation. And conservative heads explode when you talk about that because for them it's all about reproducing, reproducing. You're not supposed to have sex unless you want to reproduce. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people have sex just because it's purely pleasurable. Yeah. And what I also love about your book is right off the bat, you focus on this misconception about women not being as sexually hungry, I guess, as men are. So right. can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. If, if you look at, well, we look at four major sources of information, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to sort of triangulate when you're talking about how our ancestors lived 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago. So we look at primates, most closely related to humans, the bonobos and the chimps. We look at anthropological data from hunter-gatherer societies that are organized the way we know our ancestors were organized. So there are similarities between those, the way they live. Um, we look at uh, contemporary psychosexual research, what sorts of porn turns people on, mm -hmm. what sorts of issues people go to uh, therapists over, you know, common problems that come up in relationships. And then lastly, we look at uh, human anatomy and physiology um, because of the way the body is um, designed, for lack of a better word, or evolved, uh, tells you a lot about the way our ancestors lived, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see a, an animal that has webbed feet, for example, you can be pretty sure that it's an aquatic animal. Right. Uh, if you see an animal that has external testicles, mm -hmm. you can be pretty sure that that animal probably has uh, sperm competition. Mm -hmm. Sperm competition means that the competition, 
it's sort of Darwinian selection to say which male fertilizes a given female takes place at the level of the sperm cell, not at the level of the individual male. Mm -hmm. Humans are clearly designed for sperm competition. And so, uh, and I can get into all the different, you know, sources of evidence for that. But once you understand that, then you say, well, that means that female humans have been having sex with more than one male, mm -hmm. typically, in each uh, menstrual cycle, right? Because their bodies have evolved all these different ways of even choosing, a woman can have sex with four different men in an hour, and her body has a way of preferring and giving advantages to the sperm cells from one of those men and sort of excluding the other mm -hmm, men. Mm -hmm. Even though she's had sex with four men in the same session, more or less, right? Right. So those things don't evolve if they haven't been functionally useful over time. That's so fascinating because you, you do talk about Darwin quite a bit in the beginning of your book and you, you discuss the perfect little story that we've bought into. The story about how a man is you know, biologically driven to spread his seed and a woman is biologi biologically driven to be monogamous because she wants to have the caretaker help her raise that child. Mm. Um, tell me why it is that that perfect little story doesn't really jive with our biology. Well, because that story is about a world that didn't exist until very recently. Mm -hmm. That story is about economics. It's a story in which the woman is economically helpless. It's a story in which the woman has no access to the resources that she needs for herself and her children except by way of a man, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you look at hunter-gatherers, uh, which, you know, I have to stress this because not everyone is as tuned in to prehistory as, as you and I are. Uh, our ancestors, or our species lived as hunter-gatherers uh, until about five to 10,000 years ago, mm -hmm. which is a minute. It's, it's nothing, right? We anatomically modern human beings that look like us, that have brains like us, the same uh, architecture of the brain and all that, have been around for about 200,000 years. So we're talking about a very, very small sliver of our existence as a species. So you look at hunter-gatherers, and what you find universally is a very um, high level of autonomy for women, uh, equality with men uh, in almost all cases. Women have access to resources, actually more access to resources than men do because the majority of the calories that people consume in hunter-gatherer groups are brought in by the women who are out gathering fruits and roots and mm -hmm. uh, picking berries and trapping small animals. The men who go hunting rarely come home with anything. Interesting. So it's generally the women who have the food and the men who have to watch what they say or they're not gonna eat, right? So I like that. the women bring home the bacon for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better phrase, yeah. right? So, and also because the, the environment contains uh, the necessities of life, you can't cut someone off from that, right? Someone can fire you and suddenly you can't get a place to live, you can't get food, you can't get the things you need. In a hunter-gatherer society where everything is shared, there's no currency, there's no place to buy anything, what you need is all around. No one can stop you from getting it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different world. And the assumption that men needed or sorry, that women needed a man to provide, that women needed someone to protect her and take care of her, just doesn't make any sense, even logically, but it certainly doesn't make sense in light of what anthropologists have demonstrated about the way hunter-gatherers actually live. So things started to change when agriculture came about. Right. And, and all of a sudden, there's this imbalance of power, and the, the notion of monogamy really starts to take hold. Right. Yeah. The, the notion of monogamy is really a subset of the notion of property. And the notion of property wasn't active uh, until the advent of agriculture. If you look at hunter-gatherers, you find what anthropologists describe them as fiercely egalitarian. Mm -hmm. So they're not just egalitarian, but they're very resistant against anyone saying, telling them what to do or trying to arrange things. Or being possessive in any way. Exactly, mm -hmm. because... And it, it, you know, and I want to stress this, we're not talking about noble savages here, okay? We're not saying that they're naturally better people than we are. What we're saying is that in that environment, the most uh, efficient and um, productive way to live was to share. It's amazing, it's amazing, because I, I hear it and it makes sense, 
but I don't want to believe it. Why? Because I'm so conditioned by society right. to to believe in monogamy. I'm in a relationship that I want to be monogamous, but at the same time, I understand the biological urges to not be monogamous. Okay, so let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, you know that in Korea they eat puppies, right? I do now. I didn't know that they oh, ate puppies know that? specifically. They ate dogs, puppies. I knew they ate, yeah. ate dogs, but okay. Cute little puppies. Okay. You know. Um, now, you know that's true. Mm -hmm. And you probably also know intellectually that pigs are as smart as dogs. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't want to eat a puppy, right? Right. Neither do I, right? So I think there are two very different things here. In fact, in Sex at Dawn, you might remember, we begin talking about food. Because mm -hmm. I really wanted people to get this idea that something that you feel very intimately in your body is right or wrong is is determined by your culture in many cases. And the fact that you're able to think your way through it doesn't change what you feel. It's, I know, and it's the most frustrating thing in the world. Like I, I, I had a conversation with Cenk about this. And I told him that I believe, obviously I have no evidence of this, I believe that you can fight back against your social conditioning and train yourself to accept what the evidence proves. And if the evidence proves that we are not biologically driven to be monogamous, then I can somehow convince myself that it's okay to be in a relationship that's not monogamous. But then I think about my boyfriend and I think about what I would do to him if he wasn't monogamous <laughs> and the, the feelings that I would have. And I, it's just incredible to me that, you know, there are lots of people out there who are able to have these open relationships, who are able to accept yeah. what the reality is and it's because they have not only learned but they truly believe in the difference between monogamy not monogamy intimacy true intimacy and sex those are two completely different things so for someone who wants to not only buy into this but also live this type of lifestyle is there a way that you can undo the social conditioning or is it just too deep in us that there's no hope well I think it's different for different people mm -hmm. I, I think um, you know, getting back to the food thing, like I, I love uh, Anthony Bourdain's show, right? I do Where too. he goes He's great. around and you know, and he eats all this crazy stuff. And I wish I were that guy. Right. I wish that I'd be like, oh, you know, warthog anus. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. you know, serve it up. I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. I'm just not right. I'd have to be starving to eat some of the stuff that he eats. Even though intellectually I understand, you know, why does my culture tell me, oh, eat a, eat a, you know, a pig's ass, you know, hindquarter, uh -huh. that's a pork chop, but a pig's brain is disgusting. Right. That makes no sense. It's, you know, in terms of nutrition or anything. Um, so it's completely arbitrary, and yet that is my feeling. For food, it's really hard for me to change. Other parts of life are maybe easier. Like I, I live in Europe. Soccer's great. I sort of forgot about American football pretty quickly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Other people get up in the middle of the night to go to a bar and watch American football. They can't live without it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very individual thing how um, how much you can think your way out of uh, certain feelings. Right. I think, and it, I don't, it's not about how smart you are. I think it's just different people and at different times of life also. Um, find it more or less possible to do that. But I also think that people are, um, I think it's a mistake to read a book like ours and say, oh, I see, our species evolved to be like this, so therefore I should be like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's every bit as much a mistake as people who say, you know, everyone has to be monogamous because that's what God said. Mm -hmm. every, there's wide variation in our species on anything. Mm -hmm. Some people aren't sexual at all. Some people want to have sex every hour, uh, you know, or they go crazy. That, you know, I could argue that our species is highly sexual. That doesn't mean that everybody is highly sexual. Some people just aren't. So I think that it's very important to respect who you are. Mm -hmm. And if who you are is I can't uh, take a relationship seriously if I don't know certain things, then be true to that. that. That's completely cool, and and that's who you have evolved to be. Right. You know? I mean, that's a, that's a really important caveat to take into consideration. But I do think that your book is important in helping people understand the difference between sex and uh, true intimacy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think the line we use in the book is that um, love and sex are like red wine and blue cheese. Mm -hmm. You know, they they're 
two very different things. They go together very nicely. Yes. Uh, if you happen to like blue cheese or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever kind of cheese, but um, but it's a mistake to think they're they're one thing um, because then you run into all sorts of problems. Then you know you you notice your boyfriend checking someone out and you know he's sexually attracted to her, mm -hmm. and so then you feel insulted because you think that's a statement about your love. It's a love. reflection of you. Right. right, and your relationship with him, whereas in fact it has nothing to do with you, right? Mm -hmm. Him looking at her with a feeling of desire is no different than looking at a sunset or a rainbow or some other thing that's beautiful and pleasing you know, to his eyes. And so I think it's a great tragedy when couples paint themselves into these corners where they feel threatened by something that is unavoidable, which right. is that you both will be attracted to other people. And that's natural. That's completely natural, unavoidable, and it's a source of pleasure and beauty. Right. Why piss on that? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. When, I, I remember having a conversation with you previously, and you told me about how your wife will point out attractive women and then be like, oh, afraid, you guys like, both. she doesn't want me to miss it. Like, hey, right. don't, don't miss her, you know. She'll like squeeze my hand or something, like check her out. Yeah, she's That's nice. amazing. <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm all about that too. I totally do that. <laughs> why not? See, no, because no, absolutely. then you're sharing it. You're sharing it. You're not in opposition. That's exactly right. I think the sharing it uh, component is so important because then it's it's no longer something that's you know covered in deception and lies, right. and it's something that you're enjoying together as a couple, which is right. a completely different story. I think that a lot of the fear comes from losing that person, right? So, right. so if this person that I'm with, that I love, that I, I'm intimate with, admires the beauty of someone else, well, I run up, uh, I run into the issue of possibly losing that person. Right, but let's think that through a little mm -hmm. bit, right? First of all, any relationship can be lost at any time, right? So the idea that somehow you're uh, lessening the chances might be, or eliminating the chances is completely, makes no sense, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I think that what often happens is that by forcing our partner to accept a lie, mm -hmm. which is that you're not attracted to anyone else, uh -huh. and I'm not attracted to anyone else and never will be, then you're basing your relationship on something that you both know is false. And so then your partner's in a position of saying, eventually coming to a point saying, well, so I need to keep living her lie or his lie. And I just don't, I can't live that lie, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like one of you is bisexual and the other says, but you can never look at a, another man. Well, I'm bisexual, leave me alone, you know? Right. So I think a lot of couples out of fear of losing or fear of losing the relationship, they end up structuring the relationship in a way that's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, I know people, for example, uh, friends of mine have an open marriage, and I was talking with uh, the man about this, and I said, "What do you say about you know people think it's it's risky?" And he's like, "Dude, I would never leave this woman. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Why would I leave her? Like I I have a girlfriend, and my wife is really nice to her." And sometimes we have three ways, mm -hmm. and I'm going to leave this woman? Hell no. Does it go both ways, though? Does, does yeah. she get to fool around as well? Does she have a boyfriend? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. That's an amazing setup. Well, there's a lot of that out there. How, how does jealousy play a role, though? So let's say you're not even worried or concerned about your partner leaving you. How does jealousy come into play? I mean, it's inconceivable that people don't get jealous, even in a very sure. open-minded, open relationship like that. Well, I think what polyamorous would say is that, um, by the way, polyamory, for people who don't know, basically means that you can have several different ongoing relationships at the same time, uh, and you're not lying to anyone. Yeah, which, by it. the way, sounds exhausting. <laughs> but some people are up for it, and they yeah. do it, and they love it. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but what they say is that, sure, jealousy is unavoidable. Um, and, but jealousy, like any other form of discomfort, is a learning opportunity uh, for the individual who's experiencing it and for the couple who are dealing with it together. So it can be an opportunity to work through something together that then leads you to a place where you're even more intimate because jealousy is an expression of insecurity, mm -hmm. right? 
And so any expression of insecurity is an admission of vulnerability, mm -hmm. and admitting vulnerability is the way to get closer to someone, mm -hmm. right? It's the, the sort of royal road to intimacy is admitting your fears, right? And that's why we want to love someone, that we can admit our fears and they can help us and we can learn together. So, uh, you know, what they would argue is that jealousy is a great opportunity mm -hmm. to work through stuff, to think about why. Why are you so afraid? Why uh, did me looking at that particular person freak you out? Or why is the idea of me having a date with that particular person, um, the, you know, so troubling for you? And, and it also gives you a chance to sort of work out the rules, right? Like a lot of relationships who get into these sorts of things, they establish rules, you know, right. like, you know, uh, I have a veto, for example, that's a common one. Like you can, okay, in theory, it's cool, you can see other people, but, you know, if, if that guy really creeps me out, I have the right to say, not him. Yeah. You know, that's a common one. Or, you know, that, that it's all renegotiated, you know, mm -hmm. like a uh, woman gets pregnant. Well, that's probably a deal breaker for a while anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can't deal with you going out on dates when I'm home feeling horrible and, you know. So the idea that, that these sorts of relationships are static or like you get into a certain kind of thing and that's it, it's not, that doesn't work that way. So they're fluid. They're very fluid and the ones that are successful are the ones where the people love each other so much that they're both constantly um, checking in and making sure the other person's all right. Mm -hmm. It's not about causing pain to the person that you love at all. It's about, what it's about is trying to have the person you love have the most pleasurable, wonderful, rich existence they can possibly have. That's amazing, yeah. And you know, we have to admit, we can't be everything to mm -hmm. someone. Yeah. You know? Um, so I don't know if you have any expertise in this area, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you because you just made me remember something that I was researching earlier this year. So I came across um, the fetish that's referred to in porn as cuckolding, mm. right? And so I tried to understand the psychology behind that because it seemed so odd to me. Like, why would someone, a married man, find pleasure in just watching his wife sleep with someone else? And in some instances, men get a lot of pleasure out of his wife humiliating him as he sleeps with someone else. And so as I was researching the psychology behind it, I found that some guys get really turned on by the competition. Mm. Um, like it, it's, it, it's erotic for them. It really, really turns them on. Do you know anything about that? Have you looked into that at all? Sure. Um, as far as getting really turned on by it, there's some interesting physiological research in that area that shows that when, let me see if I remember this, when a, a man hasn't seen his partner for a few days, mm -hmm. like she's been away at a business trip or something like that, and then they get together again, uh, sex will be much more um, rigorous, mm -hmm. I guess is the word, and uh, his sperm count will be much higher when he ejaculates than if they had been together for three days and they just hadn't had sex, Right? Mm -hmm. So the idea there is that there's a built-in subconscious mechanism that says, well, she's been away, I haven't seen her. Uh -huh. She could have been having sex with other men, so now I'm gonna send in my, you know, the Marines here. That's and, amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so it's, you know, more evidence that this stuff is all built into us. Mm -hmm. On the other side, when a woman has, uh, when a woman's ovulating, mm -hmm she is statistically far more likely to be wearing more makeup, more perfume, more revealing sexy clothing, and uh, to have sex with a stranger of one night stand, and to have unprotected sex when she's wow. ovulating. Because subconsciously all these things are happening that, that drive so, yeah, the women right. to Her do body these risky is things. saying, let's get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, so when a woman's ovulating, she's attracted to different types of men than when she's not ovulating, right? You've probably read that research, yes, right? Yes, yes. So when she's ovulating, it's more square jaw, Brad Pitt looking guy, like your yes. boyfriend over there. <laughs> <laughs> and when uh, she's not ovulating, the more Hugh Grant kind of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Elbow from the sky for Hugh Grant, that's awesome. 
Um, that makes sense. And I recently read about this study. I mean, I don't know about the methodology behind it, so I don't know how accurate the results are. But um, the researchers found that men produce higher quality sperm when they masturbate to pornography with a different woman featured in it. So, yeah. so I guess as Jenk likes to refer to, strange pussy. Strange pussy will lead to higher quality sperm, which, by the way, was devastating for me because if you're in a, in a monogamous relationship and you're looking to get pregnant, you know your husband's probably not going to give you the best stuff because he's had sex with you a billion times at that point, right? <laughs> uh, but if, the if best he, stuff. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean, the spunk isn't going to be the highest quality. Um, but it, it, what do you think about that? Do you, does that does that jive with what you've researched in the past? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it's not just men; it's it's male mammals in general. There are a mm -hmm. lot of examples of this sort of thing. Uh, when I was researching sex at dawn and this particular topic, I remember reading about uh, farmers, I think, and the, who were um, had bulls that they were trying to, um, you know, inseminate cows with these bulls. And the bulls would come in and have sex with the cow, you know, a couple of times, and then they'd just be like, "Nah, uh, you know." In there, done that kind of thing. So then, what the farmers would do is take a blanket and uh -huh. rub it all over a different cow, and then put it on the same cow that they were trying to get the bull to fuck. And the cow, the bull would come in and smell like, oh, this is a different one. And you know, oh my god. So I think, I mean, this is just completely talking out of my ass here, but I think that's why women keep changing their hairstyles and change the look <laughs> and like, look, it's a new me, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think a lot of people do do things like that to spice up their sex lives and, and keep things interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that just because someone is more attracted by something that's strange, something that's different, that their partner is someone that they lose interest in or they love exactly. less, right? Because sure. again, there's a difference between the sexual excitement and the actual intimacy that right. they feel for their partner. Well, and see, this is one of the... I think important things about um, new relationship paradigms like polyamory is that these things get discussed and studied and, and um, there become, there's a language for it. Mm -hmm. So for example, in polyamory, what you're talking about is NRE, new relationship energy. Yeah, right? and I love that shit. Right. I'm addicted Everybody to it. Everybody loves yeah. that shit, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. that's the magic. That's yeah. the, you know, this person thinks I'm incredible and yeah. I can't wait to be with her and you can't think it. That's... Uh, not love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's NRE, that's new relationship energy. And so in these polyamory communities, that's understood like, oh, that's, that's gonna last a couple of months, mm -hmm. you know? And then you'll arrive at reality and then we'll see. And when you understand that that's just what that is, then you don't leave your husband for it, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't leave your wife. And if there's a space in your life to enjoy that while it lasts, and not have that be threatening to something that's sacred and profound in your life, then it's not as much of a threat. So I see that's where I get back to what I was saying earlier, like this idea like, oh, I might lose this relationship if I let my partner think or do anything or whatever, is actually the opposite of the case right. often. Right. You know, the, you know, I always feel like, uh, you know, if I were in a cage, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, that was comfortable and nice and wonderful and the door was always open, I wouldn't really be thinking about leaving. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely know that the more possessive you are, the more likely you are to push someone away. Well, because that possession is an expression of insecurity. Right. And that insecurity manifests in so many different ways. Uh, in my, from my perspective, none of which are attractive, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, we're all insecure, but, but my, my feeling, and my wife shares this feeling, is, you know, maturity is working away from those things. Not mm -hmm. denying them, mm -hmm. but working through them and getting to a point where you're not uh, so vulnerable and feeling insecure all the time. Yeah. And then you get old and die and it never matters. It doesn't matter anyway. It matters. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I could talk about this all day, but uh, we're running out of time and I wanted to ask you mm. one last question. So Chrissy Teigen, who's this beautiful supermodel, right. uh, recently got a lot of criticism because during a very casual interview, she had mentioned that she would never hire a hot nanny. Yeah. Okay. And she implied that, you know, men cheat, having a hot live-in nanny is probably a bad idea. What 
would you say to that? Uh, do you agree with the criticism, or do you think that she has a point? She has a point. Of course she does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, hot nannies are hot, mm -hmm. right? And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger situation, right? Oh, so you right? watched that. I yeah. did, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter if the nanny's hot or not. Strange pussy is strange pussy. So. Well, that's the thing, you know. And, I mean, one great book I read years ago called The Erotic Mind, I think, Jack Morin, um, he, there's a, a sort of a little formula in there that I'll never forget. It's that attraction plus an obstacle equals passion. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So think about that. Romeo and Juliet. Think about any love story you've ever heard. There was attraction, there was an obstacle, and the passion started to build, right? It's like water building behind a dam, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to keep getting deeper and deeper and heavier until it finally goes over. And so when you remove the obstacle, you move in together, you get married, whatever, the passion starts to diminish mm -hmm. because there's no obstacle anymore, right? That's not your fault. That's not a bad marriage. It's mm -hmm. not his fault. That's just the nature of reality, you know? And so the hot nanny, like, okay, can't have that. Yeah. Right? But every day I'm seeing that. Every day. And she sees it. And she's attracted to the fact that I'm attracted and it's forbidden. And, uh, you know, so there's a nice big obstacle there. Yeah. So whether the initial attraction was significant or not, over time it's going to build because, oh, it's forbidden. Yes. So, yeah, I think introducing that into your life is probably not a great idea unless you've worked this stuff out. And, and it's and like, yeah, I don't care. It. Fuck the you're nanny. It's fine it. with me. All right. I don't know. That's the best nuanced answer I've gotten on that, <laughs> on that very, honestly, superficial issue. I, I love it. I love that you gave that great explanation. Chris Ryan, you uh -huh. guys should check out his work, read his book. I guarantee you, you will not regret it. It was awesome. And you've been on the show so many times before, and I appreciate you coming back to talk to me about it. Anytime with you, Anna. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the interview, and we'll see you next time on TYT Interviews.